Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of Design to Move. This is Ryan Maxwell. We got Ryan Brown here. We're both movement specialists with Fluid Health and Fitness. And today we're bringing you another episode of Design to Move. This program is uh, built to help people understand movement distortion or movement imbalances that are normally present in their body. And so we want to show you how to use corrective exercise and a handful of different strategies to help reduce those asymmetries or pain cycles that might be present. So today we're gonna to address the rotator cuff tearing and how the body moves irregularly and creates that um, environment for the rotator to tear in the shoulder joint. There's lots of information to go over, um, but before we get into it, we wanna make sure you know you can have your questions answered by reaching out to us at admin at fluidhealthandfitness.com. We also write a blog on the topic, so we give you more information on it. It's gonna be listed in the description below. And as you can see to the side here, we do have a table of contents that you can read through or skip to different segments. And then we have a condensed version at the very bottom, so you don't have to hear us go through the entire thing if you've already watched it once before or you wanna get right to the meat and potatoes of it. So on that, let's get started with the protocol. You are gonna need a fascia release ball. This is our fluid fascia release ball. You can buy it online right on our website or otherwise something similar to this, something with a little grip and about the size of a softball. So let's get started. Before we get into our soft tissue release work, we're gonna show you a little bit about the anatomy or talk to you a little bit about the anatomy of the shoulder joint. Based on its basic structure, we wanna make sure that everyone realizes that no matter what your issue is, whether it's in pain or not in pain or obstructed or not obstructed, there always is some degree of impingement in the shoulder joint. Now impingement literally means to impress or impact on something. And when we talk about shoulder impingement, we're talking about the soft structures of the muscular attachment points to the arm bone that sits in the socket of the shoulder joint. Now the socket is called the glenoid. It's a little recess inside your scapula, which essentially is what your shoulder joint is comprised of. And the ball of the humerus sits in that little glenoid socket. Last week we talked about labral tears and how mismanagement of the shoulder mechanics lead to that. Well, this week we're gonna talk about the soft tissue structures that lay on top of it. And this has to do with your rotator cuff. Now your rotator cuff is a series of four muscles that basically come off of the scapula, attach to the head of the humerus, and basically allow the arm to move around in the joint. So it rotates, hence the name rotator cuff, the arm in the socket. So you can externally rotate or internally rotate to help with lifting, or again, flexing, extending the arm. Now the point being though, is that those muscles have a little gap that they flow through between the head of the arm bone, called the humerus, and the actual shelf of that joint called the acromion, so our acromioclavicular joint. And it's this little, uh, basically little hook that comes off of the scapula that attaches to the collarbone. And the problem is when there's not enough structural stability of the scapula holding it back and down on the rib cage, that the shoulder joint will roll forward and actually reduce the space of the humeral head between that AC joint. Now remember, those little muscles flow underneath of it and can get caught as your arm comes up. So when we said at the outset here that the arm always has a propensity of being impinged, at 90 degrees of elevation or shoulder flexion, there will always be some kind of compression of those tissues between that AC joint and the arm bone. So we wanna realize that it's that much more important to get or regain the stability of the shoulder by getting the, the shoulder blade to be able to glide back so that it increases the space between the shelf and the head of the bone so that you're not obstructed as you raise your arm overhead. Now the mechanics of that, the rhythm of that, are what we're gonna work on today. If we have issues with tight muscles that pull the shoulder joint forward, that's gonna make that very hard for us to, to get into. So we're gonna use this ball and take out one of the big primary internal rotators of the humerus, the pectoral major. Now we decided on that muscle group because unfortunately the pec major is a pretty important area of emotional importance. We bench press a lot, we're doing pushing movements, push-ups, you name it. Normally push-ups are an indicator of upper body strength, so you see them as part of a lot of strength protocols for PT test outs. The problem is that sometimes these muscles that are tasked to be 
again, indicative of upper body strength, also create movement distortion. So what we want to do is learn how to contain them, reduce their basic relative stiffness, so that it doesn't pull the humerus forward, and by extension, pull the whole scapula with it. Because again, that rotator cuff will grip the scapula once it's being pulled forward and destabilize the whole shoulder joint so that as you move your arm back and forth in that joint, there's gonna be more wear and tear or a disproportionate wear and tear on the structures that are tasked to keep it stable and also to keep it from being inclined like the bursa, okay? Which is this little fluid filled sac that helps to buffer the, uh, the glide of the arm in the joint, okay? So that's the deal. Today we wanna make sure that we reduce the pec once we do, when we get it back to its natural range of motion, get that shoulder blade back, we wanna work the muscles that help to create that inferior depression posteriorly of the scapula. And it's a big muscle called the serratus anterior. And then we're gonna show you how to move the arm in that scapula without moving the scapula around. If I can't move my arm without containing the scapular motion, then again, that's gonna to lead to that forward rotation and the compression, and that's how things go wrong. And how the pressure between the shelf and the head begin to fray and rip down the rotator cuff muscles, right? So if that's going on, well, we wanna take away that impetus that's creating it in the first place, restore the natural mechanics of the joint motion, teach your brain how to sustain that in everyday activities, and then strengthen it so that it gets really sticky and sticks around so that we don't have to keep on doing this corrective work and get back into our day-to-day -day function. Okay. So that's a big long explanation. Unfortunately, the shoulder joint is a very fragile and complex joint. It's the most mobile joint in our body. But now that you know, we're gonna get into it. We're gonna start with soft tissue work. We're gonna use this ball. Ryan's gonna get on the table. Let's get going. So let's say that you do feel some pain or some pinching in the front of the shoulder. That's normally called an exterior rotator cuff impingement. Just means that the muscle of the supraspinatus, the uppermost rotator cuff muscle that's tasked with lifting the arm for the first 30 degrees of shoulder flexion is being impinged. And that again means that it's getting compressed between the head of the humerus and the actual joint. So what we want to do is again, we acknowledge that there's some pain there. If you push your arm down on the arm that has the pain internally rotate it and lift it up about 30 degrees. If there's pain present, there's a good indication that there's some impingement going on. If there's a lack of strength and there's a considerable amount of pain, that's something that you may want to take up with your physician. And remember today's discourse is not going to substitute medical advice. So again, disclaimer, make sure to go see your physician if that's going on. Again, if you want to try to remediate it and try to correct for it, these are some indicators or some things that you can look out for. So we're going to use this ball to complete soft tissue mobilization. It's basically meaning we're gonna target the muscle and the fascia that it connects with the muscle and help it to elongate so we can get the muscle to relax, lengthen, or extend and get the joint back to its relative clean range of motion or stable position. So to do that for the pec, we first need to orient ourselves with where the pec attaches. Pectoral major is a big muscle on the chest wall that attaches the sternum and the rib cage to the arm itself. It goes from medial to lateral, and it allows your muscle or your arm to come in horizontally. It's called horizontal adduction. So motions like pushing or pressing, these are all things that we're gonna use these muscles for. And think about your daily activities. If you're at a desk or working out in front of you, you're always using those muscles in some shape or form, okay? So we do overuse them. So the point is, we're gonna identify where it's at. Remember, here at the sternum, comes across the chest and attaches in underneath of this little deltoid. Okay, the deltoid's the shoulder muscle. You'll feel a little recess there, and then it'll come in and attach to the humerus. The ball is gonna be placed from the sternum, and you're gonna roll from medial to lateral through the belly of the muscle until you feel a tender point, which we're gonna call a trigger point, maybe an adhesive bed or a spasm in the muscle, and we're gonna apply body weight to compress the pec between the ball and the rib cage. So Ryan's gonna do that. He's gonna lay on his side. Go ahead and get started here, Ryan. Again, he's gonna start from the sternum and roll outward until he feels that, that pressure point. And once he's there, he's gonna support his head on his fist, so he's making a bolster with his fist, and that's gonna to help to keep his head in a neutral alignment with his cervical spine, so that the bulge here, this little bony outcropping, the suboccipital, okay, is gonna be in line with his spine on his TL junction or his T-spine, 
So that's gonna hold his hip or his trunk and his neck stable. If there's pinching through the neck or tingling down into the arms, if there is compressive issues or spinal issues in the cervical spine, this will help to reduce that. And that way we can put more of our focus in on the pec. Now as we're sitting here, he should be under pressure. The ball is pushing into the belly of the muscle and we're letting it sit there for about a minute or so. Again, textbook, if we wanna see the best application, you can hold it for up to two minutes. This is gonna facilitate a release of the nervous system so that the spindle activity of the muscle fibers start to relax. That gives the muscle a chance to relax and let go. And then we wanna start taking the muscle through an active range of motion. Now remember, if there's pain present at any point in time during this motion, we're gonna to wanna to reduce the range of motion to be pain free. Pain is never good. We want to restrict or reduce the restriction of the muscle, not harm the joint while trying to do it. Okay, so what that means is that Ryan's gonna draw his arm back to the side to start, let the arm fall. He's gonna let the muscle be passive. Passive means that it's not flexing or it's not stretching against gravity. So if I just let my arm hang here, that's still under tone because it's fighting against gravity. Passive would mean that there would be no load bearing on it and it would be soft to the touch. So the belly of the muscle for the pec would be soft. He's not flexing his arm up or down, it's just soft and passive. After holding it for that minute and a half, two minutes, he's gonna breathe out, which again pulls the sternum and rib cage down and in to anchor the pec, and he's gonna lift his arm up in deflection and draw it overhead. So as he brings it overhead, he's gonna go to the first point of resistance where he starts to feel that muscle want to give back or guard or flex, or if he feels any pressure or pain in the front of the shoulder, again, we don't want to aggravate that compression by reducing the gapping. And then he's going to breathe in, bring his arm back, let it lay to the side, relax the arm, let it go soft, and then go in deeper into the belly of the muscle. This passive release will allow him to get deeper into the belly of the muscle fibers. And then as it goes through that active stretch, it'll help to pull open the protein cross bindings or collagens, or again, fascia, that may be restricting the mobility of the muscle. So let's do it again, Ryan. He's gonna breathe out, keep his shoulder down and back, glide out on a scapular range of motion. So he's gonna come up in deflection with horizontal abduction. Bring it until he feels that first point of resistance or until his shoulder wants to roll forward, and then breathe in, bring it back, and let it fall to the side. So we'd go through about six to 10 of those cycles, all said and done, it's gonna be about a couple minutes, maybe three minutes on both sides. So you wanna do this for about three minutes on the left, stop, do it three minutes on the right, and that should help to increase the functional range of motion of that shoulder so that the shoulder can now glide back posteriorly or externally and give the shoulder joint or the scapula a chance to get better connection with the rib cage. Once again, this reduces the pinching or the impingement on those soft structures between the head and the acromion. So now that we're done with that, we wanna get into our next exercise. Once a muscle has been relaxed and relieved, we can get more functional range. We now wanna target the muscle that may be restricted because of which, and this one's gonna be the anterior serratus, the posterior depressor, and again, inferior glider of the scapula, and that's the next segment, so let's get started. This exercise is gonna engage the serratus anterior muscle. We're gonna show you on Ryan exactly where that is. The serratus anterior basically is a muscle that looks like fingers that come up from the rib cage here. They sweep under, and you can see the lat here on Ryan. It would be under the lat, and it comes up underneath the scapula right here. Now, its primary function is to protract the shoulder. So protraction just means that we're gonna go from inside out and the shoulder blade is going to glide around the rib cage. So the rib cage is kind of like a ball. Think of it like a ball. And the scapula is like a cup that's gliding back and forward around the rib cage. A lot of times, because of the way that the muscles are attached from the arm and the scapula to the ribs, we'll have a tendency to roll through the rib as much as we would through the arm. And we don't wanna do that. So this muscle group, and for this action that we're gonna to try to work on today, we're gonna to try to keep the rib cage fixed and down. So if Ryan breathes out, his ribs will go down. It will hold his rib cage stationary, and then he's gonna rotate his arm around that fixed rib. So you can see that it glides backward and then pushes forward into protraction. The contraction happens here at this 
glide forward. Now, what's funny about this muscle is not only does it pull it into protraction, which you would think would actually aggravate this AC joint, it also, because of its attachment point or the way that it's oriented, will also pull the scapula back and down when its relative passive tone is tighter. So that actually holds the shoulder back so that when you move your arm in the shoulder joint, not the scapula itself, but the arm in the shoulder joint, it keeps that gapping there so we don't get the impingement and the rotator cuff tearing. Okay, so the goal for the day, again, is in this next, ex next exercise, which he's gonna do in a four point position, and you would do the same. You're gonna use your respiratory mechanics to stabilize the rib cage, which basically means I'm gonna breathe out to lock the ribs down as the shoulder comes back. Now, when he comes forward, he's gonna breathe in, glide it around, but not reduce his abdominal pressure, meaning he's still gonna keep his abs tight. So he's gonna keep the abs tight, Breathe in and reach, and then breathe out, and glide that shoulder back and around. You'll notice that when it comes back, he starts to elevate into his upper trap. What I'm gonna ask you guys to do so that this doesn't come up and again create more impingement is make sure that when you come back to retraction, you only let it retract before these upper trap muscles start to elevate and lift the shoulder up, which you can see how that could aggravate that. Make sense? Okay, so let's do that, Ryan. You're gonna get into a four-point stance. Now that he's on all fours, he's gonna position his body so that his hips are stacked right over his knees. He's keeping a nice neutral spine, so his back, his lumbar, and a nice neutral angle. His palms are directly underneath of his shoulders. We're trying our best, again, not to bring it up higher than 90, so the crease of your wrist should not be higher than your collarbone. It should be right underneath. You'll also notice that his head is nice and tucked, so he's taking the pressure off the extensors in the back of the neck and that's not gonna pull into the muscles that elevate the shoulders up, compressing into the front of the joint that we're trying to reduce. So in this position, he's gonna start in a reduced outcome or reduced position using both arms. He's gonna breathe in, expand, creating excursion through the ribs and push and roll the shoulders around the rib cage. You'll notice that his arm internally rotates subtly so the elbow will roll out a little bit. Now as he breathes out, he's gonna lock his ribs down and his shoulders are gonna glide back towards the center. And again, he's gonna go into retraction. Watch a couple things when you do that. Again, we don't wanna see the shoulders elevate, so show what it would look like not to do it. So at the bottom, you'll come down and it's gonna elevate. The head will drop down, the head will glide forward, and your neck might kick open like this. That's what we're gonna avoid. So go ahead and get out of that so you don't hurt your shoulders, okay? Reset. Work within the range of motion that allows you to keep the shoulders down and back. And again, a big focus on this one is to keep the rib cage depressed, meaning you're gonna use your abs to pull the ribs down and rotate them inward. So as he pulls the shoulders back, the ribs go in and down. So give it a shot again, Ryan. Breathe out, deep, get all the air out. Ribs are getting pulled down. Now he's gonna glide his shoulders back around that rib. So breathe in and lift. They're gliding around. Breathe out, flex the abdominals, and glide the shoulders back to neutral. Let's do that one more time. Breathe in and lift. He's keeping the abs tight, but he's breathing in around his rib cage. Now breathe out, lock the rib cage down, and glide the shoulders back into their pocketed position. If you can sustain that position, and you can do, again, about 20 repetitions through that cycle of, again, internal external rotation, then let's make it more challenging. He can do that by sticking his legs out further behind him, increasing the lever length, putting more weight into his upper shoulder girdle, right? We can go back and forth by doing that. Or he can bring his legs back up under him and he can switch his weight to one arm. And he's gonna breathe in, lift this arm off, shift his weight, try not to rotate too much. Remember, we're keeping the rib fixed. So this is all scapular, right? So don't let that other hemisphere move. Just let the arm push, now breathe out, and glide down on one arm. So remember the arm is internally rotated through the protraction. Try not to roll through the rib. Remember the rib stays down. Breathe out, compress the ribs, and rotate the shoulder back into its neutral position. Very good, good job, Ryan. All right, so what we would wanna do is 20 repetitions on both arms. We would wanna do two sets on both arms, and you give yourself about 45 seconds to a minute to recover. If it takes 
more time to complete all the repetitions because you notice that you start to show up with compensations. Shoulder starts to shrug. Maybe you start feeling a little too much pinching. Maybe the neck's going up into extension. If you can't do 20 repetitions without those things showing up, stop. Don't do as many, okay? Work within the range of motion that's available to you that doesn't provoke pain and that allows you to maintain the symmetry and precision. And then add on the volume over time. And what you'll notice is that over time, these muscles that hold it down and back get stronger and then they do their job without it having you have to provoke them through these specific exercises. So now that we've gotten these guys charged up and reduced the muscles that pull the, the shoulder forward, what we wanna do is engage the entire system and teach the nervous system how to move the arm in the joint without it distorting the shoulder movement and teach your brain how to keep this fixed in that position all the time so we can upregulate your central nervous system. And that is the next exercise segment and let's get to it. You're gonna need no equipment and you're gonna lay on the ground. Let's get started. For our next movement, we're gonna teach you how to coordinate the scapular positioning on top of the rib cage while the arm is in motion so that we can basically upregulate your nervous system and teach all these segments how to cooperate as they should in order to provide a safe environment for your shoulder to move. So the goal here is to recognize first off that there is motion in the scapula. The scapula here, you can trace it here, the medial border, and then you've got the spine over here, so it apexes right there. It will glide upward like this as the arm comes up. Now there's a rhythm to that, and the arm will come up, the actual humerus will elevate 30 degrees without very much, if at all, any range of motion out of the scapula. So I'm at the inferior border of the scapula. I'll lift his arm up to about 30 degrees. Go ahead and extend, Ryan. 30 degrees, and at that point, there should be very little motion in the scapula. From 30 degrees of shoulder flexion to 120 degrees of shoulder flexion, there's two degrees of upward flexion in the shoulder to one degree of scapular glide. At the 120 degree mark of that shoulder flexion to 180 degree, there's a one to one ratio of upward glide to again, humeral flexion. Now that's the rhythm of the shoulder and we want to protect that rhythm and facilitate the muscles that allow that to happen on a regular basis. Now remember that the positioning of the shoulder is always relative to the breathing mechanics and the rib cage position. So a lot of times people, in order to get the scapula to rotate and glide down to create enough sufficient spacing in the joint, they will use their lower back muscles to arch to bring the whole shelf back rather than supporting the rib cage through the abdominals, breathe out right, and then retracting through their rhomboids and lower mid trapezius. And you can see how Ryan has developed upper trap muscles and then less definition here into the lower mid trapezius. That's what we wanna work on are these mid lower muscles that hold the shoulders again down and backward so that the spacing of the joint is there to create clean, efficient glide of the humerus in that joint. Now, if you have compression or impingement, you'll feel pain in the front. The shoulder would roll forward. It would internally rotate inferiorly. And if you do that and lift your arm up, you'd feel how that compresses here and creates pain, especially if you internally rotate. So if Ryan rotates back to me, his rib cage, and rolls his arm forward, drops his shoulder down, you can see how this starts to protract it starts to lift off and inward. Now he's got great serratus pressure, so it's holding that rib cage or that, that scapula down, the one that we just talked about, but you can see how that could become problematic over time, if, especially if these were deficient. So again, the goal here today is to keep these in a retracted and depressed state, not by using the erectors to do it, but by using the scapular retractors and depressors. We're gonna breathe out to anchor our rib cage down hold the shoulders back against it, and then glide the arms up at a 45 degree angle until we start to feel the scapula want to lift off the ribs, and we're gonna work that range of motion to get it to be stronger and more deliberate. Then he's gonna breathe in, maintain the abdominal pressure, glide his shoulders back and the arms around on both sides here, right? And again, pulling the shoulders back into that neutral position. The majority of this is gonna to help to stabilize the neck. It's 
gonna hold the head back up over the rib cage. He's not gonna let the head carriage roll forward. He's gonna work again through the humeral elevation. As he does, the palms are gonna be in a supinated position. And he's gonna come out at about a 45 degree angle. And again, only work the range of motion until the scapula starts to glide upward and then focus on getting their shoulders back around a fixed rib cage position. A lot of orientation, but this is again, a pretty tricky joint. I'm gonna make sure that we understand all the mechanisms. Now that we do, let's see if we can put it into practice and get the job done. So Ryan's gonna lay on the ground. He's gonna lay on his back. We'll ask you guys to do the same. Ryan, go ahead and plop down and let's get to it. Now that Ryan's on the table, you can start to see what we're talking about in relationship to the ascension of the rib cage. So Ryan, we'll release your abs. So you can see how his rib cage, as soon as he lets go of his abdominals, they lift up the ribs will expand open externally, okay? So when that goes on, that allows him to start to extend through the lower back. And if he arches through his lower back, see how his arms can come in contact? So we just talked about how the maintenance of the scapular positioning could be compensated by extending through the lower back rather than using the scapular retractors. So again, the positioning of the shoulder joint is relative to the position of the rib cage. Now, if we get Ryan to engage his abdominals, breathe all the air out of his lungs, get his ribs to lock down, you start to see that upward and inferior rotation of the shoulder joint, especially those major muscles pulling the arm inward. And now we can start to see how that could pull the shoulder blade forward and create impingement again between the acromion and the humeral head like we talked about. So when that goes on and he's got his ribs braced down like this, you see that there's internal rotation in the arm. You also see that his neck is going into excess lordosis, so his neck is arching back. That means again that the shoulder is getting pulled forward, the muscles that attach the scapula to the neck are getting pulled into tension, and it's pulling the head back into extension. Once again, ocular headaches, tension headaches, again, derivative of the lack of stability of the scapula in relationship to the intra-abdominal pressure. So today, if you see that going on in your own body, we've got some additional cloths that we're gonna bolster the head up with so that he can have less pressure on the back extensor muscles that attach from the base of his skull and his cervical spine to his scapula to reduce the inputs from the tension there. And that's gonna help to protect his spine. So first thing first, make sure everything is centered up, right? Spine should be neutral before we start moving the appendages in the adjoining segment, the scapula. So now that we know that everything's centered, his hips are inside or his knees are inside his hip line, he's gonna get all the air out of his ribs by getting the diaphragm to push it down, flex the abdominals, stretch that diaphragm, figure out where your center of mass is there, and then notice where the shoulders are. Now, if you see that they're starting to already internally rotate, you would want to reduce the arm length, bring it down closer towards the hips, and then work on keeping that scapula retracted like we talked about. Now, once again, you see the ascension of the ribs, so he's going to breathe out, get his shoulders tucked back, and now he's going to start moving through the shoulder, lifting the arm into a scapular range of motion, and he could even go into a 45 into flexion horizontal adduction until he starts to feel those shoulder blades start to glide upward. As soon as he gets to the apex of that, he's gonna breathe in, bring the arms back down to center, pack them back without letting the ribs lift. Remember, no lower back. So he's gonna keep the ribs down by engaging his abdominals, hold them tight. So the abs are always on gang, so no matter what, whether we're bringing them up or down, the abs are tight. And you can always remember at the bottom of the breath, when the abs are tightest, that's where you wanna keep that rib line. Okay, so don't let it go, Ryan. So I'm gonna make sure he doesn't cheat. I'm grabbing both of his ribs. Now he's gonna lift up, breathe out. Bring the arms to the point of wanting to lift or shrug. No upward glide, he's breathing in, keeping the ribs pressed down and drawing his arms back and gliding it back. The ability to feel the scapular position because he's laying on his back in relationship to the abdominal pressure, holding the ribs into a descended position while working through the mechanics of his humeral movement in the joint is gonna coordinate the way the body makes all of these joint centers work together. So the goal once again is to make sure that we don't compensate to reinforce the wrong motor pattern that facilitates improper mechanics of the shoulder joint and by doing that, that's gonna teach us to make this a more deliberate motion for us in our day-to-day -day activities. Until we can formulate this agenda through our body in a position where we don't have to focus on anything else, 
It's gonna be really hard to reach for a cup or throw a ball or push a weight over our head or in front of us. So we gotta focus on these elements until we get the rhythm clean, till the motion of the joint works as it's intended to without creating the obstruction. So he would do this, and this is again a very particular movement, about 20 repetitions. He's gonna slowly lift the arm up and slowly bring it down. He's gonna work on breathing out to keep the ribs down as he lifts his arms up, only to the point of seeing that scapular internal elevation or internal rotation and elevation. And then he's gonna bring it down and pack the shoulders back down as he breathes in without releasing his abdominals. You're gonna do about two sets of 20. You would give yourself, again, a minute in between. If you do it slowly, you're gonna to start to feel these rotators around the back of the shoulder, in between the shoulder blades, your abdominals, maybe a little bit of cross tension through the neck. Okay, this is gonna kick in. You're gonna feel pretty, pretty sore from doing it. So even though he doesn't have body weight, the fact that he's engaging these muscles isometrically in a really small range of motion is what's gonna is what it's gonna take in order to get the physical adaptation. So remember that, I know that we've been very specific about all these details, but they do count with this. If you do the movement wrong, by employing the wrong sets of muscle groups, you actually make it worse, and you can actually set your posture up for the, the wrong course of action. Okay, so that brings us to the end of that segment and again to the end of our video. This week we talked about rotator cuff tear. This was an extension of the shoulder joint or girdle. We talked about labral tears last week. So if you didn't get a chance to watch that, go back and watch that video as well. Again, it gives you more information on the mechanics and the acceptable stability of the shoulder joint. So you're gonna to wanna to go and delve into that. If you have more questions, we do wanna hear from you. We wanna make sure you're doing it right. You can reach us at admin at fluidhealthandfitness.com. And again, one more time, we do have a blog on the topic in the description below. It will give you more information about the baselines that we're working towards and a written description of what we went over in today's video. And remember, as soon as we're done here, there's a condensed version with all of this, with just the demonstrations of all the exercises. So make sure to check that out. On behalf of Ryan and myself and Fluid Health and Fitness, thanks again for joining us. We appreciate your time. Remember, your body is designed to stay in motion, so stay moving, and we will see you next week for another episode. Bye-bye.